But I agree that the chairs can stop that video. <laughs> yes, absolutely no problem during the presentation. Okay, use or uh, will you start yourself just to save time? I'm sorry, but we can't hear you very well, uh, Monica. Would, could you please go closer to your microphone? Okay. Um, will you introduce yourself to save some time or should I introduce you? Oh, that's fine for me. That's going to be very short. <laughs> You, you can introduce, you can introduce Monica, we can start now in actual fact. Okay. So good morning or good day, good evening, everybody from um, me as well. It's my pleasure to introduce um, as the next speaker for the um, session on acute and chronic respiratory infections. Um, as many of you will know, Marielle has been secretary of um, the Pediatric Assembly for the previous two and a half years, and she is the designated head of assembly starting in September, and she's a well-known international expert on um, pediatric respiratory um, disorders, and she's now going to talk about infections. Marielle, thank you very much. Thank you, Monica, for this introduction. Uh, I'm a pediatric pulmonologist based in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and here you can see our beautiful new hospital. I don't have any conflict of interest uh, regarding infections, and uh, I hope after this presentation you're aware of the epidemiology, diagnosis, and treatment of community-acquired pneumonia, CAP, are able to recognize complicated pneumonia, and I will tell you a little bit more about when to insert a chest strain uh, and give intrapleural fibrinolytics or do surgery in complicated cases. <clears throat> As you uh, all, um, in this map, you can see um, the incidence of pneumonia to, uh, at, um, worldwide, and as you can see, there are big differences. Uh, there are quite a lot of participants, I think, from India, where the incidence is quite uh, high, uh, and the incidence is highest in uh, Africa uh, below the Sahara. If you look at Europe, the incidence of CAP is around 14 to 15 per 10,000 children uh, below the age of 16 years, <clears throat> and um, this is based on clinical findings and just x-ray, but if you only look at physician-diagnosed pneumonia, this is, incidence is around five times higher. <clears throat> Important to know that 1.4 million children die because of pneumonia annually in the world, and this is the single most common cause of death in children, accounting for 18% of all death below the age of five. And if you compare this to the death of COVID-19 worldwide, which is around 500,000 uh, death, uh, you can see that um, childhood pneumonia is a much uh, bigger problem. Except for age, <clears throat> there are several other risk factors like prematurity, children with immune deficiencies, and we all know the children with neurodisability who come to the ward with uh, pneumonia but are also preventable um, risk factors for pneumonia like exposure to tobacco smoke and to indoor and outdoor pollution. And as you can see in this slide, the risk for uh, infant pneumonia when parents are smoking is around 1.5 to two times higher with a population attributable fraction of around uh, 30%. In the low income and middle income countries, biomass smoke exposure is an important risk factor for uh, pneumonia with a uh, adjusted odds ratio of almost two. So I would like to introduce a case to you. A four year old girl who presents with cough and fever. She has a uh, temperature of 38.9, uh, slightly increased respiratory rate and heart rate crackles in the right lower zone and an oxygen saturation of 95%. So I would like to uh, ask you what would be your following action? What would you do with this child? Would you admit the child and start IV amoxicillin? Would you order chest x-ray uh, but send the child home on oral amoxicillin? Would you do blood tests uh, before discharge home on amoxicillin? or would you just uh, discharge this child home on uh, amoxicillin or on oral paracetamol? So I will give you some seconds to make your choice. 
<clears throat> okay, and can I have the votes now? Oh, sorry, I already gave you the answer. So uh, most of you would ask for a chest X-ray. Um, um, some of you, <laughs> sorry, some of you would ask for a chest X-ray, uh, but most of you would rescue this child and discharge uh, the child home on oral amoxicillin, which I feel is the right answer. And I will come back on this a little bit later. What are the most common uh, pathogens causing uh, CAP in children? Well. It, depends a little bit on the age group, as you can see in this slide, uh, with a little bit different pathogens in the very young children compared to the preschoolers and the school age children. But actually in all age group, respiratory viruses are the most common pathogen causing um, a cap. It's the most common pathogen uh, causing agent in hospitalized cases, uh, accounting for 30 to 67 percent of children admitted to the hospital and this is even higher in children below the age of one, around 80 percent. The second most common cause is uh, pneumococcus, uh, which is the most common bacteria in all age groups and uh, this accounts for around 30 to 40 percent of cases. Then we have a group with mixed bacterial and viral uh, origins, 23 to 33%. And last, uh, mycoplasm and chlamydia uh, are actually quite common across all ages um, and not very unusual in younger children. A recent study from Switzerland, um, in, in contrast to this data, uh, this study showed only 2% uh, of mycoplasm in uh, school age children as a cause of CAP. So what are the most common viral um, causes? Uh, RSV and influenza A and B are the most common, followed by a metapneumovirus, adenovirus, and the parainfluenza viruses. As you all are aware, there's a disconcordance between what you can find in the upper respiratory tract and the, if, the uh, causative agents in CAP. So um, in a quite recent study, um, where they looked at a carriage of viruses and bacteria in the nasopharynx in healthy children. In 62% of those children, a strep pneumonia was identified, in 50% Haemophilus, Moraxella was very common, rhinoviruses are common in healthy children, although RSV and influenza are not very common in children who are healthy and don't have any symptoms. If you have a child with uh, a radiolog radiologically confirmed cap uh, who's wheezing, then this is a very strong predictor that the origin of the cap is viral. I included one slide on COVID-19 in children. If you look in uh, PubMed now, you can find almost 500 hits on COVID-19 children and pneumonia all of the last six months. And as you all know, uh, children are really a minority uh, in this pandemic and only account for one to 5% of all cases of COVID-19. In general, they have a milder disease and death in children uh, due to COVID-19 is extremely rare. Most children uh, present with fever and respiratory symptoms, but some don't have fever and some only present with gastrointestinal symptoms. And we recently did a survey within the pediatric assembly of the ERS, uh, looking at children with respiratory diseases as a risk factor for COVID-19. But actually those children don't seem to be at an increased risk. There were only very few children with CF admitted with COVID-19, with asthma and with BPD. And actually there are uh, some, uh, there's some evidence that children with allergic asthma and might be a little bit protected against COVID because of uh, the downregulation of uh, ACE2. If you look at CT abnormalities in children with COVID-19, um, many children have a normal CT, and if there are abnormalities, the most common abnormality is ground class opacities. And those ground class opacities are more common in the lower lobes and often are unilateral. 
um, in some children there was a follow-up CT made three to 15 days later, and in a few of them uh, this disease progressed. And you will all be aware of the Kawasaki-like multi-system inflammatory syndrome that has been described in association with COVID. And this is um, these are these are some examples of CT findings in uh, COVID-19 in a female. Oh, I'm sorry. Female 14 years of age, and you can see in the ground glass opacities in the lower lobes. Um, a male of 10 years again, <coughs> and a very small infant of one year age. <coughs> so, bacterial uh, cap uh, strep pneumonia is uh, found in 30 to 40 percent of cases as the single or co pathogen. And important to know that in uncomplicated uh, cap blood cultures or pleural fluid cultures are only positive in 2 to 10 percent of all cases. So they don't seem to be very useful in uncomplicated cap. Other bacteria are group A streptococcus and Staph aureus. They are less frequent, but they are associated with more severe disease, including empyema and, uh, and, and ICU admission. Um, in 2007, um, in most, in 2006, in most countries, uh, vaccination against pneumococcal disease was introduced, as you can see here in the slide from the UK. And this had a um, uh, after this introduction of this PC uh, B7, including seven serotypes of pneumococcus, there was a decrease in hospital admissions due to pneumonia and a slight decrease in empyema. However, you can see that there was a natural selection of serotypes not in the vaccines, with again an increase in empyema and an increase in uh, hospital admissions because of pneumonia. This led to the introduction of the 13th um, vaccine, uh, including more serotypes. And uh, again, you can see that after this introduction, there was a sharp decrease in cases of empyema although there seems to be a small increase after 2014 again. So what should you uh, do as investigations in a child with a cap? I think we will all do pulse oximetry, which is of course important to define if a child has a severe disease and needs oxygen and admission. CRP is not useful in children with uncomplicated pneumonia, but uh, should be uh, checked in children uh, which are hospitalized or in complicated cases. And then uh, maybe the PCT may be of uh, even more value. And um, this is a recent uh, study where they looked at the predictive value of CRP for a definite, uh, definite uh, bacterial pneumonia. However, this was defined as uh, empyema or a clear uh, septic child. Uh, so this is a selective group. And in this selected group, CRP had a good discriminative value for uh, bacterial or viral uh, pneumonia. And in another study, um, again, the uh, predictive value of PCT, CRP, and neutrophils for bacterial pneumonia was determined. And as you can see here, CRP was actually not too bad with an area under the curve of 0.76 but PCT was uh, actually the best predictor with an area under the curve of 0.87. A chest X-ray is only needed in children with complicated or severe cap, and in some countries there's a lot of tension for point-of-care ultrasound at the ER, which has a quite high sensitivity and moderate to good specificity for consolidations if you compare it to chest x-ray, but of course this depends on experience of the physician. <clears throat> Other tests uh, might be uh, uh, antigen detection of strep pneumonia, which has actually a high sensitivity, but a very low specificity because it may also um, be positive in children who carry a strep pneumonia in their upper respiratory tract. And uh, molecular methods um, show promise, of course, but are currently most used for uh, viral pathogens. 
in severe or complicated pneumonia, I think we agree we would all do uh, extensive blood tests, including electrolytes and a blood culture. And we will try to find the causing agent by uh, nasopharyngeal uh, swaps for PCR and immunofluorescence. You can do serology for virus infec viral infections, mycoplasm. And if you are going to drain a um, empyema, everyone will send in pleural flu fluid for culture and microscopy. But you can also ask for a pneumococcal antigen in pleural fluid and or PCR. Important for CAP, uh, are we going to treat with antibiotics? And if so, uh, which antibiotics uh, will we choose and by which route? When can you change IV uh, treatment to oral treatment if you started IV treatment and how long should we treat uh, a pneumonia? Well, these are recommendations from the BTS guidelines. If you have a clear clinical cap, so uh, based on fever, tachypnea, then uh, actually most children should be started on antibiotics because you can't make the difference between a bacterial and viral pneumonia based on clinical features or based on radiology and even CRP, as I showed you, is um, not very useful in uncomplicated CAP. However, in children below the age of two years who have mild symptoms and are fully vaccinated, um, you could wait and see because in uh, these children, a bacterial origin is really very unlikely and viral infections uh, will be the cause in more than 80% uh, of cases. <clears throat> what about uh, IV treatment or oral treatment? Uh, in this study from quite some time ago, from, uh, which appeared in uh, Thorax in 2007, almost 250 children were included uh, above the age of six months who uh, had to be admitted with fever, respiratory symptoms and X-ray changes. So again, this is a a selected group of children and they were randomized to oral amoxicillin or they started on IV benzyl penicillin for two days and then uh, were converted to oral um, uh, treatment for seven days. The primary outcome in this study was the time to reach a temperature below 38 degrees uh, Celsius for, for 24 hours and at the time um, to oxygen requirements to cease. And this uh, is the main result of this study, uh, as you can see um, on the y-axis, that's the probability that the primary outcome was reached. And on the x-axis, you see the time in days, and there was no difference between the IV treatment and the oral treatment. So the conclusion of this study was that IV antibiotics should be reserved for children that are unable to absorb oral drugs because they're vomiting, uh, <clears throat> or those children will present with septicemia or a really complicated uh, pneumonia with pleural effusion, for example. Which antibiotics should we uh, use? Amoxicillin is the first choice actually in all guidelines, except if there's an allergy to amoxicillin. <clears throat> you can consider to add a macrolide if children are not responding to treatment and in pneumonia associated with influenza, coamoxiclef co uh, is recommended. Um, I think the most important point of this slide is that you really have to apply to local guidelines because there can be important differences between resistance in uh, bacteria. <clears throat> to come back to our four-year-old girl, she presents at the ER after four days. She was sent home on oral amoxicillin but presents at the ER after four days uh, after using this amoxicillin with an increasing respiratory rate, fever, and decreased activity. She has a high fever, uh, oxygen saturation is 91% in room air. Uh, at physical examination, you find decreased air entry, crackles, and dullness over the right lower lobe. Uh, here, the chest X-ray is seen. As you can see, there's a uh, consolidation um, on the right uh, lower lobe with the impression of fluid, of pleural fluid. And this is confirmed by ultrasound when there is a 2.5 to 3.5 centimeter thick pleural effusion without uh, septation. And the child has a CRP of 180. 
So what would be your treatment or your choice now? A, would you continue this, would you start this child on IV antibiotics? And the IV antibiotics are in all choices, as you can see. But would you also insert a chest strain? Or would you insert a chest strain and give intrapril fibrinolytics as well? Or would you go for IV antibiotic and ask your surgeons to do either a FETS or a thoracotomy? <clears throat> so can I have your votes? Okay, <clears throat> can, I, can I see the votes please? Yeah. Okay, so most of you would uh, start a child on IV antibiotics or everyone will do that, uh, I guess. And uh, many of you will start, will insert a chest strain and some of you will add intrapural fibrinolytics in the chest strain. Okay. So if you look at the guidelines, uh, the most appropriate answer would be to continue IV antibiotics and insert a chest strain and give intrapural fibrinolytics. But there is quite some variance between countries. And if you have a very experienced surgeon who's very good in fats, that may be a good option as well. And in some countries, uh, fibrinolytics are actually, like in my country, are not used and we would only insert a chest strain. Well, all cases need antibiotics, including cover for strep pneumonia, of course. But again, you should adhere to local guidelines. Um, for hospital acquired infections, I'm not talking about that uh, today, uh, a broader spectrum cover might be needed. And if you have microbiology results, it's very useful to guide your treatment, of course. But in many cases, you won't uh, get any uh, microbiology results because children are pre-treated. In general, after uh, chest strains are removed and the child is afebrile for two to five days, you might switch from IV to oral treatment. And in general, a total antibiotic treatment of two to four weeks is recommended. And in many hospitals, uh, oral antibiotics will be continued for one to four weeks after discharge. So how to manage a parapneumonic infusion in children? This uh, is a flow chart from uh, up to date. So I start with the child with a pneumonia with infusion on the chest radiograph. If you have a small infusion and the child is not in respiratory distress, you can treat with antibiotics and wait and see. Many children actually will improve. Around 10% of all the pneumonias uh, have some pleural effusion and most children won't even uh, be seen in the hospital. <clears throat> so if children improve, we, you can of course continue conservative treatment. If there's no improvement in 24 to 48 hours or the child is deteriorating, you should repeat the chest radiograph and see what's happening with the effusion. And if it's uh, becoming bigger, you go to the flow chart for management of a moderate to large pneumonic effusion. Do you need to um, drain all the children who have a parapneumonic effu effusion? Well, maybe in some children, conservative treatment with only antibiotics may be enough. And this was shown in this study in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery, um, where in a retrospective study, 240 previously healthy children were included with a median age of four years. Uh, they all had MPEMA and they were included in a period of six years. And actually 27 of those children only received IV and antibiotics and there were only two failures. Of course, this is a uh, selection uh, of children. So um, these are mainly the children with a small effusion, which means less than one centimeter or less than one quarter of the chest. Um, and these are the children who are not septic septically ill. In this study, most children got a chest strain with urokinase. Uh, there were quite some failures, but also a very high percentage of children who improved and only few children went on for thoracotomy. And of course you can discuss if that's the best uh, surgical option. So what to do with a moderate or large effusion? 
um, again here the small effusion, children with a moderate to large effusion, and or the children who are in respiratory distress or look very ill, then uh, uh, ultrasound is needed or a CT scan. I think in most hospitals, the ultrasound will be uh, the first step. If it's a simple effusion, not loculated, you can put in a chest drain uh, and continue IV antibiotics. And if children improve, that's enough. However, some children will have persistent or progressive symptoms. Um, and then you probably need to do more. Well, if you put in a chest strain, uh, send always in for analysis um, of biochemical characteristics like glucose, uh, protein, send in for culture and for PCR. Again, a clinically well child with a small effusion, but even the children with a moderate to large effusion, well, 50% is maybe a little bit high, but at least 25% of the children will recover with antibiotics alone. So let's move on in the flowchart to the children with persistent or progressive symptoms or a big effusion. And then we're talking about a complicated effusion. Um, in these children, uh, fibrinolytics might be a very good option to prevent surgery. If children after drainage and uh, fibrinolytic treatment still have persistent or progressive symptoms like fever or respiratory distress, then a CT scan might be needed to see if this is parenchymal disease only, which means you need to continue IV, IV antibiotics and have some patient, or if this is a persistent loculated effusion, which may uh, be a reason to ask your surgeon uh, to do a FOTS or a um, small thoracotomy. Fibrinolytics are successful in a high percentage of children. You can choose between urokinase, alteplase, or streptokinase. A urokinase has the, uh, is the preferred option because that has been used in a randomized controlled trial, but it's not available in all countries. And then alteplase is a very good alternative. If you compare the length of hospital stay between children who got a um, chest strain with fibrinolytics versus a FOTS, there's actually no difference, except if the uh, FOTS was performed very early in the disease. What you choose is also dependent on the local situation. What's the expertise of your surgeons? Um, costs may be important, and also patient preference may be important. Important to stress that outcomes are actually excellent with all treatment options. If you use fibrinolytics, again, urokinase is the first choice and uh, the protocol in general uh, recommends to give this for three days, uh, twice per day. And alternatively, you can give alteplase two to three times a day for three days. Now, actually very uh, little uh, complications. Major bleeding is extremely rare. Uh, allergies have not been described in children, but children can have pain and fever. And uh, these fibrinolytics are contraindicated if there is a bleeding disorder, but also if there is a bronchopleural fistula. Chest strains are usually inserted on the general anesthesia. And uh, in general, we prefer the smaller chest strains because um, this makes it more easy to mobilize the patient. Uh, however, then you really should use the fibrinolytics because otherwise it will clot in the drain. And I think it's very important that you need a, a experienced staff uh, at your department to handle patients with a chest strain. Surgery um, can be uh, a, ver a very good option if uh, chest strain uh, drainage fails. Um, and I think an early discussion with your surgeon, surgeon is very important if you have a child with an empyema on your ward. <clears throat> So to come back to our case, um, on day five, a chest drain was inserted with thick pearl fluid coming out of the drain. Culture was negative and no fibrinolytics were given. On day seven, the child improved. There was no oxygen need anymore. CFP uh, decreased and the child did not have a temperature anymore. On day nine, the drain was removed. 
However, unfortunately, at day 11, the child got a fever spike again, uh, developed tachypnea, retractions, and again, an oxygen need of two and a half liter per minute, and her CF CRP increased to 95. This was the X-ray uh, that was made um, at that moment, at day 11. And again, my question is, what would be your uh, treatment now? Would you switch IV antibiotics? Would you ask for a chest CT scan? Would you reinsert a chest drain or reinsert this drain and give intraprural fibrinolytics? Or would you now ask your surgeon for VATS or even for lobectomy? So six options. Marielle, just to remind you, your um, lecture time is almost over. And yeah. we have quite a few questions. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So most of you would ask for CT, and that's exactly what we did. And as you can see here, there was a air, cap, uh, air collection, a collapsed lung, and also some um, uh, pleural effusion. And um, actually, our child uh, had a bronchopleural fistula, uh, which was um, seen at the CT scan because of the big uh, air leak. So what can you do for a bronchopleural fistula? Uh, I think the most appropriate option is to put in a drain and wait uh, for quite some time. We had a patient who was sent home with a uh, drain for almost two months. But there are also non-surgical options, especially in very uh, ill children with selective intubation of the healthy lung and the bronchial occlusion, or in very uh, sick children, you could go for ECMO. Surgical options uh, are um, quite difficult, and uh, one of the most used options is to close uh, the leak with a uh, flap of the serratus anterior. Few slides on necrotizing pneumonia, which is a very severe form of lung disease um, with necrosis and cavitation. <clears throat> Often you see bronchopleural fistula there or an abscess and the children uh, have the same clinical symptoms as a pneumonia but are much more ill. And uh, necrotizing pneumonia is associated with certain serotypes of uh, pneumococcal and certain uh, staphylococcal infections. And this is a typical <coughs> CT scan of a child with a necrotizing pneumonia where you see all these cavities, necrotic tissue and uh, at the arrows, you see uh, small abscesses and there's an air collection as well. Uh, Long-term broad-spectrum IV antibiotics are needed, some also uh, targeting this PL PVL staph uh, as well. And uh, I think pleural drainage is often required, but has a high risk of complications like bronchopleural fistula. Lung abscess. Um, a typical picture here on the chest x-ray is a tissue destruction or necrosis leading to one or more cavities. And in general, the treatment of a lung abscess will be with uh, antibiotics for a prolonged period of time. Here you see a CT scan of a typical abscess. Um, interventional radiology is another option if children are very ill with needle aspiration uh, to get out the pus of the abscess. So the take home messages are that empyema in children may be treated with antibiotics alone, but sometimes a chest strain with or without fibrinolytics or a VETS is needed, but actually most, the vast majority of, goal of all children will recover. Uh, bronchopleural fistula is a severe complication of empyema or necrotizing pneumonia and should be treated as far as possible conservatively, but sometimes uh, more heroic actions are needed. And complicated pneumonia, I think it's very important that this requires a multidisciplinary team, including a uh, experienced surgeon. And this is a CT scan of the child six months uh, later. I think now we continue with uh, the next presentation and we will take the questions after the next presentation. Is that correct, Monica? Well, I think we have a few minutes to follow up your presentation. Thank you very much. This was an excellent overview. Very, yeah. And I've got some questions um, related to the um, empyema. 
Um, one question is, um, well, does the size of the chest strain influence outcome? Do you know that or is it just... Um... <clears throat> There's only one study comparing small chest strains versus the thicker chest strains and then the outcome was a little bit better in the small board chest strains and the reason for that may be that children can mobilize uh, uh, more easily uh, because if they really have a very thick drain it's, it's well, they lay in their bed um, well, you can imagine uh, that it's really painful, uh, but it's only one study, and in that study, fibrinolytics were used in the drain as well. Mm -hmm. There's one que important question to um, simple pneumonia. May I give a macrolide instead of the amoxicillin because it is easier to take? Yeah, <laughs> I fully understand that. Um, well, the guidelines advise amoxicillin uh, with an alternative for uh, a macrolide. Um, and if you have allergy, of course. I think um, problems with resistance are um, the only reason why the first choice is amoxicillin. So that's the first choice, but the macrolide may be an alternative. Okay. Well, I think we have to take further questions later, and it's now my pleasure to... Ernst, are you there?